So I'm Brian Woodfield, and I'm a professor at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And, um, um, and so I've been at BYU for 23 years now, and um, I'm the creator and developer of the virtual labs. Um, I'm a physical chemist, I guess, by training, a uh, physicist, low temperature okay. physics and materials. Um, but I also obviously have put a lot of my time into developing these virtual labs for the past 20 some odd years. So, um, so I'm a, a co-founder of Beyond Labs um, um, with colleagues, um, Heather. Heather is, is one of our um, founders here. Um, she's been working with me on the labs off and on um, for a number of years. And, um, and so uh, we're, we're a small team trying to, um, trying to help everybody out during this crazy time. So Heather, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So I help develop virtual physics. I'm a physics teacher and um, I'm going to help write. So if you're contacting us, I'm the one that's going to be helping you right now with support and getting all of the worksheets and educational materials you need in the background um, on these. I live right outside of Worcester, so I'm in Massachusetts. And um, I see there are a bunch of people from Massachusetts here today. That's great. That's good. So um, yeah, so I have this I have this habit of having students in my class and when I see how smart they are I try to hire them to work on various projects so Heather was was one of those um, from the beginning so um, the virtual labs were uh, originally developed at BYU um, uh, we had a small team um, a developer and an artist but most of the work was done by students over the years um, Many of our art students work at Pixar and other um, major gaming institutions, and um, a lot of former students are now physicians or professors somewhere else, and or teachers like Heather. And um, and so um, it's been a, a great project over the years. So the labs were originally sold by Pearson for many years. If you've heard of them through that channel, a um, couple of years ago we pulled the licenses back from from Pearson and we started Beyond Labs about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And, um, and so that's where we are right now. So, so hopefully um, Heather will answer questions on the chat. If you got questions, just uh, write a quick question to her. If you are perfectly welcome to unmute yourself if you're muted and, um, and um, I, switching to my ear pods i just realized i was on my computer and so um so if you got questions feel free to unmute and ask questions and um i'm sure we have a pretty diverse group like we normally do lots of chemistry organic chemistry but usually we have a few physics and biology as well is that the case heather yep so we've got Two, two physics from what's reported and reported so far, and then lots of gen chem and ochem. Okay. No I haven't seen any biology yet, so please chime in if you want us to cover biology. So obviously I can't cover all the labs and how they work, but the goal here is to give you uh, an outline of how the labs work and answer any of your questions. So how do you use them? How do you, how do you implement them in your classroom? And, and, and things like that. So, so with that, um we got kind of introductions out of the way and um so i'm going to share my screen and before i kind of get into the labs i want to give some background here so um i think oops i need my mouse it kind of shuts off my mouse here for a sec all right so um so let me kind of give you a background of these labs. So these labs have been used, like I said, um, through Pearson, they've been used by a million students or so over, over the decades. They've been through about four different iterations and updates, um, but the principles behind them are, um, are, are pretty much the same. So um, I think, I. I I know that most of you just want to see how to use them and see the worksheets and stuff, but I think 
understanding a little bit of of how they work and how we designed them and why we did what we did would be very useful as you find a way to implement them in your unique situation. So, so these are just four screen captures of four, four of the different lab benches. We kind of are designed around lab benches where each lab bench is capable of doing what we try to be an unlimited number of, of options and, and selections for the student. Um, so we have gases, for example, inorganic qualitative analysis and microscopy here, you know, um, some collisions. We have about really about 16 or how it depends how you count 19 different benches. Um, but these are just four, four quick examples to kind of show you where we're going. But before we get there, I, I, I want to um, get to kind of historical and a, a historical perspective um, and, and trying to do this within about five minutes. Um, but the, um, you know, I wish I was really smart and had thought of all of these ideas before we started developing the labs, but we really started developing the labs. And then after we developed a few of them, really discovered what we had made. And so the issue here, the question that we started asking ourselves after making these labs was was what makes gaming addicting so you know right now we're 2020 but this is back in 2002 2003 and and we wanted to understand you know what makes a video game what makes any game so addicting that people will play it over and over again and so we got a phd thesis out of this richard swan um, did this work and we came across five principles that that we discovered that makes a game effective or a game really engaging. And the, these principles were game world, game challenge, player presence, help, and fear of failure. So I'm just gonna use an example. Um, I could do this a lot. I'm gonna use Monopoly, it's not a video game, but it's in a game nonetheless that, that kind of demonstrates these principles. So the game world of Monopoly is a simple board. So if you want to think of video games, then think of a first-person shooter game or, or some other types, types of video games. But in this case, it's just a board. So it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, it doesn't have to be 3D graphics. But the board, each of these spaces represents a property. And so, and so the game world is this board. The challenge in this particular case is to make everyone go bankrupt except yourself. So you're trying to be the richest person and everyone else goes bankrupt and then you win. Player presence is how we interact with the game. So how do we translate our world into the game world? And so in Monopoly, we are represented by tokens, so it's really easy. But in a video game, perhaps it's a game controller or a joystick or something like that. So it's the translation medium. So you gotta have an effective translation medium between us and the game world. Embedded help is how you figure out how to do the game. And I think that's kind of unique for modern games. And modern games are, they kind of embed how you learn how to do the game in the game itself. So it, it in, in and of itself is a discovery process. So getting help is part of the learning process of a game. And finally, it's fear of failure. And this is where we think it is most important. Fear of failure inside of the game controls structure. It controls strategy for how to get to the game challenge. So in Monopoly, your fear of failure is low at the beginning because you're trying to land on spaces so that you can get Monopoly. So you don't fear landing on some property. But as the game goes on, you know, then you're gonna fear your, your strategy for, for what you want to do may change so that you can avoid landing on certain spaces. So the cost of a failure, the cost of a penalty, then changes your strategy. So a super easy example of this that I thought about when I was in London was when I'm in London, you know, I never think about when the trains are coming because the trains come every two or three minutes. And so when it's time to go, I just go down to the to the underground and the train's gonna come in two to three minutes and I hop on and and then I'm ready to go. The strat, there's really no cost to being late. But in Provo, we're a small city in, in Utah, right? We have trains, 
but they those trains leave every hour, right? And so the strategy for when you catch a train is going to be quite different. You're going to plan your day or your time around to make sure you're not going to be late because if you miss the train, then you're going to waste an hour of your day. Um, and so the cost of doing things is is what's is what's um, is what costs here. So so as we translate this into science and it, and we translate it into um, laboratory work. Um, I think of laboratory work as, as the same kind of idea as a game. Obviously, it's not a game, but the principles apply. We have a challenge. We have a world. We have this lab. A biology lab is going to be different from a chemistry lab, which is going to be different from a physics lab. But we have these world with this equipment. How does a student interact in that world? How does a student get help in that world? But it really comes down to what's the challenge? What's the learning goals in that lab? And then what's the cost of failure? So this is a picture of the lab that I teach for, um, that we teach for our majors and non-majors, um, freshman chemistry class. You know, it's just full of equipment that doesn't do anything until I create the learning goals. So just another view of it. It's got equipment, drawers, and it's got a stock room um, for, so we can con control things. But it really doesn't become a learning environment until we put in the students, until they start doing the work and, and doing things. But imagine what their stresses are and their, and their fears are as they do a lab. If they make a mistake, they could be out two hours. They could be out a grade. Um, and so, most of these students to protect themselves from failure are going to cookbook. And so the idea that we had for these virtual labs really originates in this idea of being able to control the structure of the class, construct the structure of the learning in the laboratory. So we need real labs. Obviously, during this time period, we don't have access to our labs. And so a virtual lab is going to be, you know, the next best thing that we can do. But, but the real important parts of our virtual labs that I want to show you aren't the lab replacement per se, which they are, but it's creating an environment like you see here in this real picture where students are free to do what they would do in a real lab and experience consequences. But in this case, the consequences in a virtual lab are not so dire. There, there's no safety issues, time issues, liability issues. So we can allow students to explore. And so from my viewpoint as a scientist is, to me, it's all about teaching students how to be a scientist, how to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And so, that's what we have in these labs is this ability to um, have students you know go into a lab experience real outcomes and not be artificially fundled by um, constraints of a simulation because whoever developed the simulation didn't want to account for all the different possible scenarios so that's kind of that's kind of my introduction um, um, so I'm going to minimize this, and so, um, so that's kind of what I want to show you. So let me show you now what our real labs look like. So I'm going to start with general chemistry, and then go to organic, and then do some physics at the end. But this is our client, and our client um, stalls on Mac and Windows. And it provides access to the different lab packages. So when you buy it, you get all five of these lab packages. We also have lab activities, worksheets, and they're organized by different levels. So we have high school worksheets, higher ed worksheets, and then each level is organized into a generic set of, of, of topics like thermodynamics. And then maybe they're going to be specific heat of aluminum and we have background information and then we have the procedures that get started so these are meant to be generic we have procedures collect their data we have answer we have questions and assessments to ask them 
calculations to do and so we guide them through. So it's typical like in a real lab, except here we can control structure a little bit. So we can give them a highly structured worksheet and then maybe we'll give them a worksheet where we'll say just now go measure the heat capacity of this and not give them the instructions and they have to figure it out. So we have a collection here for general chemistry. We have 80 higher ed worksheets. Um, high, school, high school has about 30, organic has 120, and physics has about 40. And so we have these worksheets, but by no means are these worksheets meant to be the only things you can do with our lab. Um, so, so let me show you kind of how a lab works. I just click on one of the, on one of the labs. This is general chemistry. It's going to launch. And, and so there it goes. I'm going to, because I always forget ahead of time, so I apologize. I'm going to change the resolution on my monitor because I have a high res laptop here. Makes everything look kind of small. So here is the landing page. So each product has its own landing page. Each one of these icons represents a lab bench. All right. So, um, and then down here, you'll notice we have these worksheets. So these are organized in the same way as these worksheets are organized. So you see here for higher ed, I have the same organization as these. And so if I go into, say, um, gas properties, I can do Boyle's Law, pressure and volume, and I can click on that and um, be brought to the experiment for gas properties with the balloon and then what i would what the student would do is they would go here to gas properties Boyle's law and then here is the worksheet and it would say start virtual chem lab select gas properties Boyle's law and the lab will open note that the balloon in the chamber is filled it's filled and so we're going to step them through um, each of these um, activities so now a student can do anything they want they'll they'll maybe want to follow the directions but maybe it's going to be increase the pressure and see what happens to the volume as you do that or maybe it's going to be now decrease the pressure go back to you know one atmosphere or now we're going to increase the temperature maybe they go too high and it pops the balloon so um so this is just kind of how it works so we have these worksheets that have the presets um, so um, so so any questions about that i just showed you a quick example of how our content our content's not to be all encompassing it's supposed to hit the needs of most of most situations but you're free to write your own content or modify our content and, and in any way that's going to fit your needs in, in the best way Oh, can I ask a question on that one? Sure. Okay, my name is Roman Carada from Santa Monica College. When right. you said we are free to modify our content, so I've been looking at the organic one closely. So like, for example, there's quite a few reactions there, but uh, like if I take esterification lab, for example, um, we do it in a little more kind of uh, a robust way for second second year so we put in uh, unknowns in there uh, so ra rather than just doing the straight lab and so there are quite a few of your labs are like that but is that possible for us to ask if we can have a modified form of that is, so, so I asked to one of your rep, but I didn't get an answer because if we want to use it, we want it a little more robust than, than what it is. Uh, like, for example, the aldol condensation, we want unknowns in, using unknowns in there. I know you have a qual analysis lab for unknowns, but even the other labs, we embed in them something like that. It's a little more robust. So, like you said, is that possible for us to ask you? to rob, make it a little more meatier than it is or is that how is that how does that work so that um that's a that's a great question so so um i'll give you the i'll, I'll give you the practical answer first and the practical answer yeah. is is that 
you know, we currently don't have the resources or bandwidth because of other, mm. other high priority projects that we're working on to go through and customize the labs. So for example, mm. the organic lab took us two years of mm. about eight students working two cold total years to get that, to get that lab done. And okay. we don't have the resources to go in and actually customize the actual simulation. So when I say okay. customize, what I mean is, within the constraints of what the simulation allows, you are free to customize the activities that you can do within, that, within those constraints. Now, okay. the more general answer though, is that mm -hmm. the, way we've, the way we've always constructed our simulations is that we do construct them so that they can be um, modified without mm -hmm. having to touch the code, for example. So, Okay. I'm showing you right now titrations. So mm -hmm. we have these bottles. So we have a standard 100% pure KHP, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we have hydrochloric acid that's 0 0.1031 molar, right? Mm -hmm. We can actually, the way that we've set up the simulation engines that drive all of these virtual labs is somebody could. Okay, that somebody is yet to be determined, but somebody could go okay. in and say, I don't want HCL, I want HBR, or I want HI, you know, or I want some other weak acid besides acetic acid or hydrocyanic acid. We have the ability to go in there and change what these bottles are and these concentrations are in the database. We just don't have a way for the user to do that yet. Okay. So organic, you could do what you're asking. It's just mm. that we can't do that yet because we haven't provided the infrastructure to go change that. Okay. Thank you. But tagging on to that, the initial question was, absolutely, we hope you will rewrite our worksheets to be exactly what you need. So using the lab as it is right now, I am uh -huh. happy to give you the Word versions of any of these worksheets and please make them exactly what you need obviously within the constraints of the simulation, but please, yeah, go right ahead, adjust them, make them the level that you want for your students. We've got tons of unknowns, Brian will show you how to use those. And you can yeah. give your students the normal assessments that you would giving them unknowns and checking to see if they've learned the basic concepts. So, for the, not the qualitative analysis, just the regular labs, the right. other labs you're talking about? Yeah, yeah there are unknowns in every lab. Yeah, yeah. Except, okay. for, except for the synthesis lab and organic. Doesn't yeah, the synthesis lab, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't have any right. unknowns. Yes. And, you know, it's, 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 yes. a, it's a legit question. I, I don't mind yeah. the question at all because I want that. The, the mm -hmm. issue always came down to, it was a balance of, you know, the constraints placed upon us by time, resources, and money we had to develop these labs. There's, you can't always do everything you want. And so, yes, yes. but we did design it for the day when we have the resources to come back and add that and it's possible it's just not going to be in the next month or two hopefully yes. when we get it into an h so we are actively converting all of this into an html5 format so hopefully general chemistry and organic chemistry get done in the next year you know we'll have the ability to go do that and so it's it's going to be possible just not for summer term or fall term. Okay, thank you. All right, All right. Let's, so that, that's a great question, um, but let me get back to kind of showing you how the labs work. So notice here <laughs> that in titrations, I just click the lab bench and it's an open-ended lab. So that's why I, I, I kind of want you to kind of imagine you walk into a lab and it doesn't do anything. I mean, it just, Students need to be guided on what to do, but I want to show you that it's geared like a real lab in the sense that it's open-ended and that, you know, grab, you know, you can go grab a beaker, you can go grab your, your pipette, um, you can turn on your pH meter. And so it's that open-ended feel like a real lab. The lab activities that we've provided are that drop-in solution, that starting point for you to use the labs to actually do the science, to actually do the experiments. 
but we fully recognize that what we've written is unlikely to be an exact duplicate to what you're doing in your particular laboratory environments. But we've tried to be at least general enough so that the principles and topics being covered are the same, even though there might be changes in concentrations or changes in the exact chemical that's being used. So, so, um, so this is just kind of how, how it works. We can, like I showed you, we can go into the stock room. Let's say that we were going to tell the student how to standardize their NaOH. And so in this particular case, they already know their NaOH. So we always try to create these environments where the student knows what the answer should be so that they can practice. And then we create the unknowns um, when, when possible that, that then um, have them actually prove that they know what they're doing. The idea being teach them with a lot of structure and then pull that structure away and test their knowledge and not their ability to memorize procedures. So I'm just, I'm not gonna do a complete one here. Here's NAOH. I've just filled up my, my burette. I clicked on it to open it so I can see the meniscus. I'm not gonna need a um, pipette here. I need a beaker over here. So I'm gonna go bring my KHP down, click on my, analytical balance there's my weight paper every weight paper weighs different it's random open my lid take some powder different scoop levels are right there so there's 0.2 grams and it's random every time so i've added it so i can come here and i can add water from a graduated cylinder or i can just go to the sink and add it I could weigh the water if I want, turn on the stirring, pick one of the, you know, an indicator there's phenyl failing. Now, you know, I can go through here and I have to calibrate my pH meter. So I just gonna kind of show you that it allows you to do that. So you can, you know, you don't have to fill your pipette all the way. You can pick the wrong mass and these the glassware isn't perfect it has built-in errors in it it has random errors so you can teach the students what the random errors are and what the systematic errors are barometric pressure changes every day so that you um so the so that the buoyancy correction if you're going to go have them do a buoyancy correction can be applied here on the analytical balance so we try to make this thing as realistic as possible now we also have in each of these labs these clipboards that do presets. So Sorry. here's a preset. Can, can I ask a question? Uh huh. Sorry, uh, I know you said you make it as realistic. I'm I'm sure you have a reason for just putting the hand. Is that harder to put a person there than a hand? It just when you say as realistic, I is it like a little person going around and rather than a hand. I don't know. I, I don't know if it matters, but I don't know if the students would feel, when I tell them to watch a video, I tell them, imagine you, it's you there. So it's So with this hand that kind of pops up here on the, on the stopcock, for example? Yes, uh, we've this, chosen not to make it look like Beyond Labs where it doesn't look like your hands with gloves reaching in manipulating equipment. Um, because it still looks like a simulation, no matter how so, fake your person, your avatar, or whatever it is in the lab. Yeah. yeah. So we okay. we, yeah. we were, you know, we're the first virtual lab. So we we came 20 years be before before yeah. Labster did. And you know, I'm Labster is not. I am not going to yeah. criticize Labster. I'm just going to point out the difference. Labster oh, yeah. is meant to be a story that kind of puts a student on a journey where mm -hmm. they're on rails where they can <laughs> look out and see a beautiful yeah. scenery but they really don't yeah. have the ability to make all the different mistakes and really go wherever yes. they want to go and yes. that's just the difference and so okay. you can't do it all so we try yeah. to focus <laughs> okay. on the decision making all right thank you yep all right i wanted to kind of show you here that i picked a clipboard right and the clipboard here had knowns and unknowns for practicing. So these are presets. Um, so here in the preset, notice here that I had an acetic acid unknown, that's unknown number four. So we have about 15 <laughs> different unknowns for each of these different chemicals. 
and um, the instructor manual has a key that tells you what the actual concentrations are so students can come here and get an unknown and now say okay now I'm going to um, actually do this titration so I can control my stopcock I can whoops and here I can click save save this data I can click save here's a graph I'm saving my conductivity, my pH. Obviously this data is gonna be lousy because I'm, I'm titrating so quickly so we can control the rate at which we do things. Um, and so <laughs> let's just kind of get through and show you kind of we get to the end point, we get our color change. Obviously I skipped the pink in between because I was going so fast. And so I can click stop, and then I can go to my lab book. And so this is where we can store data and students can uh, take notes. And here's that graph, here's the data that I saved. And so we can copy that data and they can go analyze it. So this is a common theme that when we have numerical data, they can copy it. Here's a graph so they can take a snapshot of what it was. And here's the data so they can analyze it like in Google Sheets or Excel or something like that. So we can do, you know, oxidation reduction titrations, acid base titrations. We have monoprotic, diprotic, triprotic acids, monoprotic, diprotic, and tri, mono basic, dibasic, and tribasic bases, solids and liquids. And then what you can also do is click on that unknown sign. And then you can also create unknowns here. So I can create a uh, hydrochloric acid at unknown and I can control the concentration range and then, and then this creates an unknown here that they can go titrate. Or like in my lab, what we do is, you know, we get a, we get a KHP and um, so let me go clear my lab here. I can click on my disposal bucket. And like in the lab that I do is we give them 100% pure KHP and then I'm going to come down here and um, um, find my, there it is, potassium hydrogen thiolate, and I can control its range. So it's usually somewhere between 40 and 60%, and I can return. And then here's an unknown. So I can go actually prove that they can go report this. I would want to come over here and take my known concentration of NaOH and then report that. You could also create an unknown NaOH and an unknown KHP and force them to titrate the NaOH first and then take that answer to go titrate their KHP. And then after they do the titration, they come to the lab book, click report and put in their, put in their answer. And then it shows them what the actual answer is. And then what they would do is they'd come over here, save this file save this file externally and then upload that to your LMS so that you or a TA could go through and grade these, grade these, um, these answers. So we have these two different kinds of unknowns. We have these, um, we have these unknowns here that are kind of preset. And then you can also come in here to the unknown sign and create these um, practice unknowns for them to practice with or assigned unknowns that you want to customize to be exactly what you want for the unknowns that you're interested in based on the chemicals that we have. So any questions? Any questions? I spent a lot of time on titrations, but I wanted to kind of show you how, how they all work. Uh, there was a question for showing off the physics labs, but I don't know if you want to go to organic first or transition into physics. I'll go into organic, but let me kind of give you a brief outline of some of these other benches. Um, so we're at 1236. So I just kind of want to show you what the other benches will do. Um, so we have ovens and ice, um, ice here, and we have coffee cups and doers and bomb calorimeters. We have metals, so you can measure not just the heat capacity of a metal, but 64 different metals. We have salts and organics, so heats of combustion, heats of solution, heats of reaction. You can put the salts and do colligative properties. So for example, here's freezing point depression, boiling point elevation. Here's heat of solution of ammonium nitrate. I can drag that, here's a preset. Here's my temperature. 
So now it's starting to cool. I have my stirrer on. I can do electrical calibrations, water levels, save this data just like we can. So we can do calorimetry, Hess's law, enthalpies, entropies, um, and things like that. So inorganic, it's a, it's a very popular lab because it's quite unique. And that what you can do here is take a test tube and then you have access to these 26 cations and you can add them any order, any combination. So here's a great example on the hand question. Notice here that I'm just clicking to add it. So what we found, what we found early on in our research with the labs is that if it's something that's really cute, but it gets really tiring after like the five times you have to do it, then we kind of take advantage of a, of a computer interface to make the experience more efficient. So I'm interested in here that the students know to add chromium, not that they know how to manipulate a bottle and pour it into a test tube. To do that, it's a real lab. So the principle here is, what, I'm, what I was trying to show you in the beginning is that these virtual labs are meant to augment real labs in the sense of helping them do things, um, prepare for the real lab so they understand the decisions and the whys or to extend what they're doing in the real lab by doing experiments they can't normally do. So here in inorganic, for example, no one's messing around with lead or with mercury anymore but the chemistry is here so they can still learn that really important chemistry. So here's a test tube and now we can centrifuge or we can do a flame test. So here's a flame test showing the copper. I can do a flame test with a cobalt filter. Now I can add any of these reagents. I can go pH 10, pH 7, I can go to sodium hydroxide, go add the acid, go back to pH 10, sodium hydroxide, centrifuge that, I can decant, and so now I've done a separation and, um, of my chromium because it's amphoteric, then I can go add ammonia, centrifuge that. I can smell that if I want to. I can measure the pH of the, of the solution. And then look what happens if they say, what, what if their pH is wrong? Then they're both amine. So I have to have high pH, centrifuge that, decant, and now, I can go to pH 10, pH 7, go add carbonate and see the cobalt carbonates um, that's formed here. And then again, I can create unknowns when the clipboard or create unknowns here for practice unknowns. And you can do any of the 20, any combination of the 26, all 26, and we have a real outcome. So we did all permutations. So 10 to the 26 permutations of what students can do. I showed you gases. So let me really quickly show you quantum mechanics. So I've been noticing talking to other institutions that sometimes they do dry labs or they do um, theory labs. So this is an example of labs that you would not normally do here in atomic theory. And that in this stock room, we have lasers, electrons, super light bulbs, alpha particles, and the different detectors and different sample holders, so like gases and metals and liquids and oil mist. So they can go through and do experiments in atomic theory. So clipboard again, here's Rutherford. I've got alpha particles coming through a gold foil hitting on a, on a phosphor screen. I can move my phosphor screen over here and still see alpha particles. I can move it here on the side. And it looks like I don't see any, but there's one. So this is all real backscattering data that we measured um, using actual thicknesses of gold. I can move the gold. I can come over here and pick one of these 60 some odd different metals and say, hey, what does magnesium look like? Come out here and put the magnesium in front and say, wow, this is, why, this is way different. Why does it look that way? So Rutherford, Millikan, um, here's Millikan right here oil drop, change your electric fields and move drops around. You can come over here and do photoelectric effect. Um, or here's two slit diffraction with electrons, wave particle duality. So these are really nice experiments that you can do, um, you know, to really talk about atomic theory 
and and uh, and teach how these experiments went. So, any questions about general chemistry as I go into organic? A molecular modeling lab. Seems like so maybe I, that could be a good one. I don't have a molecular modeling lab. Yeah. Yeah. What we were trying to do was, what kind of experiments would you do in a lab? Like, oh, sorry. Okay, like what kind of experiments do, do you do in a lab? And, mm -hmm. you know, a real scientist isn't going to do a molecular modeling lab. I think molecular modeling is great. I use it all the time when I teach Jenkim. Um, but, but the idea for us would be like, well, I don't want to take the time, but in, in um, you know, in this lab, we have FTIR, so we can understand about vibrational rotation. We have NMRs. And in the other lab, we have absorption and emission spectra. And so we have the labs that would actually that we would do as scientists to reveal bonding, but we don't have one that's like a molecular modeling lab per se. Thank All you. Right. Yeah, no, that's no, your your questions are good. Um, Thank you. Um, so here's organic. So for those interested in organic, we have two lab benches here, synthesis and qualitative analysis. So um, same setup, we have worksheets. By no means are our worksheets cover everything you can do in these labs, particularly when it comes to technique. Um, but the goal here is, is synthetic targets. If I want to make a certain product, how do I make it? How do I get there? And so so what we have here on the chalkboard is we have these different named reactions like Diels Alder, Aldol, Grignard, and and by selecting one of these, what you're doing is selecting a set of starting materials. So if I pick a sterification, I picked a set of starting materials, but that doesn't mean that I have to do an esterification reaction. I can pick zero, one, or two of my starting materials. So if I come over here, I'll add this alcohol, I'll add this acid. Um, I can do zero, one, or two, any combination, and we'll have an outcome. I can pick none or, or one of these solvents, so ether, ethanol, or water. I'm not going to pick one in this case. I drag my round bottom out here, and then I can pick any of these reagents. So notice that I don't have to necessarily pick my sulfuric acid to do a sterification, I can go pick something else. And we're going to have an outcome. We're going to have the product and we're going to have the kinetics and we're going to have the result. So what if they add something and it's incompatible, it's going to blow up, it's going to foam over, it's going to create tar. And so we have all of those kinds of synthetic outcomes and their kinetics. So what if they don't add heat here. Well, then it's going to take longer. We have the kinetics. So all of our reactions are based on experimental rate laws that's in the literature and the rate constants that have been published in the literature. So in this case, you know, maybe I want to add heat, but maybe the student says, oh, I just need to add heat. That's what it says in the book, add heat, but they don't realize that they have to add a condenser. And so Maybe they'll start this reaction and they'll think, oh, everything's going great. Look, I'm making a product already. I'm doing good. Here's my TLC. I'm going to go measure TLC. Wow, I'm making product. Here's my starting materials. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more. And then, boom, I wait too long. I build up pressure and I blow up my, um, I blow up my, my glassware. So, um, so we have these outcomes. We want students to kind of make these mistakes, here's methanol, here's, a, here's an acid. I'm gonna go add this one and I'm gonna go add my, I can double click, I've added my sulfuric acid. I'm gonna go add my condenser. I'm gonna go add my nitrogen. I'm not an organic chemist, so don't test me on any of this. Here's my heat, right? And so now I'm gonna click and I'm gonna start. So this one should work, it should blow up. I have nitrogen that's vented. So this is a common question we get is, um, why is there only one spot here? Well, there's two spots now, but why is there only one starting material spot in the lane? That's because methanol's too light. It's not gonna show up on your plate. Save this to the lab book, advance my time, go do another one. 
Um, and so I'm almost done. I'm gonna save that and advance my time some more. And boy, one little spot. Notice the shapes are different based on their polarity. So I'm gonna go one more. And now I finally have my, I'm finally done. I can confirm that with the TLC. No starting materials, I got a product. Now I'm gonna go work up. So I'm gonna go drag my set funnel. And now we can do some ex uh, extractions here. Obviously here, this is pretty simple. Um, it's catalytic sulfuric acid, so it's not very much. But if they stop the reaction too soon, you can do distillations. If you make a solid, you can do recrystallizations to go see what the crystals look like. In this case, you can pick acid, base, or water, so you can do countercurrent extractions. So here's, I'm just gonna add water in this case. Here's my product, I've added ether. I do a rotovap step, take off my ether, and there's my product. Now the idea is to prove they made it. So obviously an organic one, they haven't learned about the spectroscopy. Um, and so maybe you're not gonna have them go do that part, but it's available. We have peak numbers down here, are the peak numbers that show the integrations. Um, save that to the lab book. I can do a carbon 13. So this is all real data, real NMR data, not manufactured. Um, we have mass spec um, data here. And the whole idea is to teach them how to, how to analyze what's going on here is FTIR of, of that. And so they can demonstrate what they have. So um, obviously this is geared around synthesis and making targets, but, but you can create, um, um, you can create activities. We haven't done it yet. It's on our to-do list to create things like different sophisticated extractions here or show how to use distillations and um, you can create presets to, to do that. So qualitative analysis um, is, the idea here is to identify what you have. So what we have here are compounds with different functional groups. And what you're seeing here are knowns. So the students can practice, so it's the same idea. Have them do it so they know, so they can see what's going on and then test them that they really know it and they just haven't memorized. So I know that we have used this as a lab exam in the past. So instead of just having them kind of regurgitate their procedures and their whys, we actually have them, we'll go, have them go do a qual here as a lab exam or do a synthesis as a, as a lab quiz or a lab exam. It's pretty effective. So here's an aldehyde. So Notice that these three are known, so they can practice, but this is an unknown, so unknown number 210. So again, we have in the instructor manual, we have a key, shows you what these are. Each student will only get the same unknown on the same computer, so they can't just cycle through until they get an easy one. They, they get what they get. So here's an unknown, boiling point, carbon hydrogen analysis. Then they can take an aliquot, and now they can do any or all of these um, chemical tests. So Jones oxidation, show a real picture or a real video of the outcome, if it's positive or negative, so they can learn you know, um, what they have here based on the chemical tests. Um, and then again, they can go do their um, NMR, FTIR, and everything else to go decide what they have. So this is pretty powerful way to really go put real spectra into use to really identify um, what's there. We also have the ability to do, again, these, you, you notice that we've always had numbered unknowns, which are kind of fixed because they're kind of easy to use, but we also have random unknowns. So I can click here on aldehyde and notice that I have an unknown now. So it's one of my, I can't remember, 25 different aldehydes that we have, 30 aldehydes, but this time it doesn't have an un unknown number. So they would go through, do their analysis, then they would go to their lab book, click report, put in the name of their compound, and then it shows them what the actual answer is, and they'd come over here, save the file, um, and then lab book number 
to save that file and then they can upload that and then what they would do is um, then the ta or or whoever it may be would then upload those lab books and grade them but you don't have to use the lab books you can some some professors just have them take screenshots of what they have and and do that so so that's what we have for general and organic chemistry any questions head on Before over I to go. physics okay physics can i ask one question on the organic qual please sorry sure. yeah so the qual analysis is very close to the way we do it in reality uh, uh, except that may maybe there is a solubility uh, test that we include. Is there a possibility? I know you said, you know, with the bandwidth is what you're looking for. Is there a possibility to make it a little, that one at least make a little more robust? No? Um, what is the possibility? <laughs> well, because, I, yeah. The way we've set up the, the algorithms, uh -huh. you know, that would be, you know, that's that's possible to go to go do that yeah we could yeah, do that thank but thank you but the thank but the the problem is is you know it took us a long time to take all those yeah. videos and all those pictures and to yeah. do that so it's so fantastic it's i like it it's yeah thank you yep all right physics same structure worksheets lab book lab um lab benches Notice that we've taken gases, calorimetry, and quantum from chemistry and included it in physics. That's because the same topics or experiments can be used. However, the, obviously the worksheets are different because it's a different class, different learning goals, different topics that you're covering, but the experiments are there. And so we bring those in. Um, so we really created these four. Um, lab benches, mechanics, density, optics, and circuits. So in mechanics, um, um, this one really covers a big swath of what's covered in a algebra or calculus-based physics course is still a lab bench, but here's our stock room in this case, which is full of gravities, frictions, forces. So obviously this is virtualized, but the idea here, I mean, this is my take. I taught physics once, um, 1996 at a small college in Virginia and um, you know the the thing I found as a teaching physics was students were had a difficult time bridging a qualitative understanding and how a quantitative mathematical model understanding could help enrich our understanding of what's going on and the other thing that I noticed as a physics teacher was it was difficult for students to control their variables because we couldn't get rid of gravity. We couldn't get rid of frictions really well. Now, I didn't have a great physics setup. Um, some schools have really great frictionless tables and stuff like that. But the idea here was to qualitatively see results and then collect data and then analyze it and compare to models. So that's the idea here. So we can control gravities in different directions. This is just my nerdiness. I, you know, and um, reading science fiction, I always learned about gravities. And so we have these different gravities, frictions, forces, ramps, um, and objects that we can play with. So here's an example of, I can bring a ball, I can take a plunger, I'm gonna take my downward gravity, and I'm going to go add air friction, all right? And I'm going to go play with those. And so here's my experimental table. I can go Cartesian, polar coordinates. I can go, I have a parameters palette here where I can change what the material, what the ball is made of, what its diameter, what its mass, where the mass is, initial velocities, angles. I don't have a ramp on this experiment. I have friction, so I can change the I can change the um, air pressure. I can change the force being exerted by that plunger. I can change the size of my gravity so I can pick another planet if I want to. And so, so here's just how an example of how I would do it or how I have done it is I'm trying to teach some students about 
you know, basic laws of motion. And then so I put a ball out here and I say, so what's, what's the ball going to do? And 75% of the students say it's going to fall because they're on a vertical monitor and they can't get rid of gravity. So you click start and nothing happens. And so then they say, oh, I don't have any forces. So I reset, come bring in my gravity. And now I press start and now the ball falls. And then here's this data. So um, I can start recording this data. I obviously started too late, but I can record it. Um, and then I can, I can uh, click reset. And that data is now in this lab book. And now all of this data can be used to copy and analyze it, graph it, and look at what's happening. So now what I can do is adding an air friction, air friction. So what happens when I do that? Click start. And now I see that my acceleration is changing and it's going to go to zero. Now they can go mess with the diameter or mess with the mass. And now you can do an experiment with a feather and a bowling ball and actually see that they would fall at the same time if you didn't have air friction. So we reset that. Then what I can do is come over here, move my ball, come over here and put in my, my plunger. I can control my angle here on forces, for example, and get the, get the exact angle I want, click force, and then launch it. And now I can reset. How does that motion change? If I put my air friction back and now I click it, collect the data, analyze it, and, and do that. So this is just one simple example. We have collisions. Here's some presets. Here's billiards. Here's a force. Here's collisions. Hey, look at this. There's how I have friction turned on in this table. Reset, otherwise it would go forever. Hey, what happens if I change elasticity? Click force. Now the balls become really sticky. Um, control all of that. Do 1D, 2D. You can do radial gravity. Here's a force with a rocket. Have them do circular orbits. What does it take to do a circular orbit? Um, we also have solar systems and, and ramp motion. So lots of cool things you can do there in mechanics. Um, let me go to optics. Um, so in optics, <clears throat> we have um, objects. So I can take like a candle, move it here. I can put a detector in my virtual eye and um, and then, um, so go move this a little bit. So right now I have autofocus on, so I can put out lenses, I can put out a mirror. So here's a mirror, I can rotate my mirror. Um, and so I can see both images at the same time. I can click on this gear and I can, that's a flat mirror now. I can change its radius if I wanted to. I could put multiple mirrors. Um, so I can do concave mirror at the focal point. I could do a concave mirror between the, the, um, the, the center of curvature and the focal point. And we're gonna show the different sizes. This is also autofocus, um, do reflections, so sight lines. So all kinds of things you can do here in optics with prisms and lenses, change the curvature of the lens, the density of the lens and so on. So um, we have circuits. And um, so for circuits here, we have a breadboard and engineering paper. So what a student could do is they could build a schematic of something here um, on this engineering paper, for example, and um, connect it up and they can go put it in a function generator and build the circuit. But then what you see is that that circuit is also being built over here on the breadboard. And I can come over here and change that to 200 or I can change its accuracy or I can change its wattage so that you can burn them out, um, things like that. So, um, so here's schematic or I can come over here and build it on a breadboard and compare what I'm building on a breadboard to what it here is on the schematic. And then I can um, 
come over here and bring on my digital multimeter or my oscilloscope. So you can build up to 35 components of any circuit that you want here. And I can go change my frequency, for example, and see what happens as I do low pass, high pass filters or whatever. So, and finally we have density. And this has turned out to be quite useful for chemists. So maybe if you're only looking in general chemistry, you didn't know that this existed, but I'm, I'm seeing that a lot of um, chemistry, general chemistry labs actually do uh, a density measurement. And in this case, we have a graduated cylinder and um, I can pick my fluid. So we have these different, so here's car oil, for example, or um, honey, for example. And so I can fill this up with honey and measure the density of honey. So what you could do here is you come in and you zoom in and you have to measure that volume. So they have to go through the pain of interpolating. I can go measure its mass here, tear it, and then um, drop that and pour it in. So we, we, we have all of these different things. You can do, um, so let's go here and do like um, we have mercury, milk, olive oil, for example. I could fill it halfway with olive oil and then come over here and fill it halfway with milk. So you can see what's miscable, what isn't miscible. And now you see how the level changed because um, the oil is lighter. And then you can take different objects like sodium and then you could weigh the sodium if you wanted. Um, um, take this off and I could go weigh the sodium or you can drop the sodium and then it blows up because it hit the milk. So we have density, um, lots of different solids and, and fluids uh, to go measure the density on. All right, questions, comments? This is Jason Barber from Anne Arundel Community College. Hi. You uh, did a really nice job talking about the randomness in the chemistry lab. Is that something that is built into the physics benches as well? Um, I said I couldn't remember. What did we build into mechanics for randomness? Um, <laughs> so long. <laughs> For sure, for sure, the density, the density is really irritating because those graduated cylinders are 250 mil cylinders, and so their accuracy is not very good. So they are realistic in that we just we went through and did x I don't know 20, 50 different measurements and measured how accurate those were, and we took the specified accuracies. The balance is 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 the same way. Um, so when it comes to the circuits, yes, you, so you notice that in the circuits, I had a 5% accuracy. And so the actual resistance of each one of those is going to be, of each one of those resistors is going to be randomly selected within the accuracy of that tolerance that's specified for the resistor, the capacitor, or the inductor. Um, for um, optics, I don't think we built anything in on that one. And for, um, and for the mechanics, since we didn't really do any quote measurements, I don't think that we, I don't think that we built that, that in. Um, I think that you would probably, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I'm happy to look back through the algorithms that we programmed. Um, there's certainly, we're using a Runga Kata um, derivative calculator. And so as students collect their data in mechanics, based on how small the time gaps were, right, between each time division and how fast they've accelerated time, that certainly does build in some variability because they may be getting the next jump up or, oh, when their ball hits the ground or when it hits the bottom of the ramp or something like that. So, um, I did a quick experiment. This is Jason Barber again. We uh -huh. did a quick experiment just dropping a ball and 
then I put it into Excel and graphed it and it was, you know, it was an R squared of one. There was, there was no randomness in that, but I didn't know if maybe in some of your other experiments with inclined planes or other things, maybe there was, but so far I hadn't found it, but I haven't spent much time yet. And you can add in, have you tr added in the friction and the air resistance too, so that it doesn't exactly model perfect R squared of one. Right, but with the air friction and, well, with the air resistance and other friction, is it adding in random amounts? Like, is it irregular or is it just going to be a set amount and it's going to be completely 100% reproducible? It'll be completely reproducible. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's not what I wanted to hear. I'm sorry. You can help us design some more. Yeah. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be that hard to add it, but. No, it wouldn't. Um, um, since it wasn't really, since there wasn't really a tool being used to measure, I don't, I don't think it crossed our mind to go randomize that that noise you know we did do a great deal of that in chemistry and it's not that I, it's not like you can't tell i'm not an anal person okay <laughs> so um but um i i just think that the it's it's probably one of those things that that um at the time that we were developing it we were focused on other things and, and we didn't and we just we just didn't uh, consider that, but it actually would be quite simple to add at some point. We should add it to our list, Heather. Like, like we're like I said, we're porting all this into HTML5 so that we can do browser-based instead of just locally installed, and that's quite easy to add that. Um, do that. So, I'm just going to go do two two of these and uh, reset and go to my lab book and so five seven six four seven see it's different okay so what we're doing is we're randomly sampling at different times right notice we're randomly sampling but the algorithms probably you're right it's probably perfect and so the algorithms just um, accurate. So I we did. To, I knew that we put some stuff in. So we do our time slices randomly, so it doesn't look like it's reproducing the data. But we're not building in any errors into the measurement because we're not using the tool to measure. But that was that's 15 years ago. So maybe I don't remember correctly. I am getting old. <laughs> so, but that's a great question. So you so notice that the time slice is, is random. So I know we built that in. So great question. All good questions. Our work one, is never done. I have one more question. I I know it sounds very silly, but you uh you, the your uh, first uh, purpose was for it to be a supplement for labs, but right now actually we are using it as lab when we're doing remote and when we're doing now next semester we're doing even distance yet so we're really using it as lab now uh -huh. uh, so is that possible to put like type some type of time thing that they students can think about that this takes one hour this takes two hours this you know because it they think it's a click at a click of everything is happening. So well, there, is, there is a clock built in there and you can see time advancing in the lab. So, and, and, so no, and what it's, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so in organic, yeah. so where, where, time is, where time is critical, we've added it, okay? Right. So for example, in, mm. in synthesis, for example, so you, there's no question, there's no question that they yeah. sometimes get a false sense of how long it takes. So, so yeah. for example, we do have a clock here that you have to advance to show them how long the reaction actually took. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's yeah. how we check to make sure they're not cheating is to say, Oh, I just advanced it three hours when 
no, it only really took 45 minutes to get to your product, but you were just lazy and just did three clicks on the button, right? Okay. And so we do have that, like the calorimetry lab has a clock where we, where time is critical, and, but we can advance it so it goes faster. We actually have a cost counter in the molecular biology lab in biology, which mm -hmm. I didn't show you, but we have a cost. So when they're doing a PCR experiment or a sequence or a gel, we're actually totaling up the cost of each one of these labs as okay. well as tracking the time it takes to do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we and biology, we also have, um, we also have an ecology lab where we track st populations of species over time in different biomes, and that time goes. Obviously, we accelerate it, but it goes, you know, you know, by years, by one year, five years, ten years, fifty years. So, um, so time we ha we build in time um, as appropriate, but not everywhere. All right. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other great questions? More things we could do and add to it, Heather. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I love uh, the spectroscopy on the and on the koala analysis or all the all of them. Thank you. All right. Somebody else was speaking up. Yeah, Dylan Bartlett, uh, Santa Monica College. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have anything for kinetics experiment? So, no. The next lab we make will be kinetics. It's already the algorithm and data is already configured for a classic iodine clock reaction. We have that okay. and that's going to get implemented in our next one. And that, um, will that be ready for uh, the fall? No, that won't be ready for fall. Okay. Fall 2021. All right. Thank you. Yep. We have so much to do. What are we doing here? Dealing with the pandemic. Thank you. What have we been doing the last 15 years or so? It's great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I have, um, I have another question if you have time. Sure. In the um, e and bench with the circuits, you showed how you can set it up on the engineering paper or on the breadboard. Can you can you require that students learn how to use the breadboard? Because it seems like if you want <laughs> if you want our students to learn how to be able to use the breadboard to make it more realistic, I don't know how we could force them to do that. Something so that can... the answer is um, no, we can't we can't do that. The um, However, in my experience, it's the <laughs> auto-created breadboards are not very elegant or systematic looking. The algorithm that we put together for that in order to be generalized was actually quite difficult. And what they build manually is looks quite different than what they would build um, automatically. In fact, when Heather went through and created all the presets in that clipboard and the, the other assignments, it, we, it actually, we always built them on the breadboard um, so they would look better. So, so no, the answer is no. The program isn't designed to force the students to do anything. You could certainly do that in writing your assignment to assign them. Like, okay, you need to build it here and take a screenshot, <laughs> right? Save the, save the image of that. Um, but our program won't force them to do one or the other. Yeah. Okay. So you, so you're saying I could probably tell the difference. Oh, just absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All right. Yeah, you'll as you play around with it, you'll see that like it just when you build it on this on the paper, it jams them together and like uses it. It's not the way a student would normally build it. It worked with the algorithm we made, but it was so hard to make that work. It doesn't look pretty on the breadboard yeah. when you that build that. Algorithm was hard. Okay. Thank you. Yep. It's a classic under constrained system. And so we had to make some assumptions in order to get, get at it. And um, beautification wasn't one of the constraints we added. So 
Yeah, just just so you know that the algorithm we use for that circuit is um, a Laplace transform. So we 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 take what they build and pull it into a Laplace space and and find the all the roots and then take it back down into real space to go find it. And that was the only general algorithm we could figure out that actually worked for anything. Everything else, all the other algorithms that we could find didn't work. All right, thank you for your time. And we appreciate your interest and, you know, most likely you contact us, it's going to be Heather. If you go through the Beyond Lab support page, you're gonna get Heather. If you go through sales, you're gonna get me or Kelsey, um, one of our other uh, team members and uh, Jay, um, he'll, he'll dabble in, in that as well. So feel free to um, ask your questions. Oh, the contact and, um, information is there? I, I don't remember seeing yours or... Just put right through the website, he's saying. So if you reach out to us on the support page, you'll get me. Or on the sales page, you'll get Brian. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank and you. we hope to see you on another webinar, maybe. Talk to you later. Bye. Goodbye.